Hi, welcome to Bookie. To unlock more world-class bestseller, please download our app. Just search for B-O-O-K-E-Y at Apple Store or Google Play. You will get 7 days free trail with more features. Hi, welcome to Bookie. Today we will unlock the book to Pixar and beyond. Even if you have not heard the name Pixar, you are probably familiar with a series of popular animated films, such as Inside Out, Toy Story, The Incredibles, and Finding Nemo. The film Coco released in 2017, is a classic work that dealt with common themes of human life, such as music, inheritance, children's choices, the interpretation of family and love, and the understanding of life and death. People entered the cinema with a smile, but came out with tears in their eyes. It received emotional praise, with people saying, what an amazing film. Since the establishment of the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature Film, Pixar Animation Studios has won a total of eight Oscars out of the 16 Academy Awards, accounting for exactly half the total number. Pixar and Disney jointly announced that, Disney would acquire Pixar at US$7.6 billion US dollars on January 26, 2006. Pixar produced high-quality works, earned the highest awards in the industry, and made stable box office returns. They had finally found a powerful owner. Pixar showed its excellence in various aspects of its success. So, how did Pixar get here? The story began when Steve Jobs left Apple Incorporated and then started investing in other companies. In 1986, Jobs acquired and reorganized Pixar's predecessor. From the very beginning, Jobs expected that Pixar would produce high-end imaging technology for the next generation of computers. At the time, Pixar had no main business income, but did research and development in animation as well as some additional profitable areas. The company had no special sales or marketing team. Before 1995, Pixar had nothing but an extremely remarkable studio. Lawrence Levy, the author of the book, joined Pixar at Jobs' invitation as the vice president and chief financial officer in 1994. Later, as one of the five founders of Pixar, he joined the board of directors to manage the company, develop its business strategies, and lead the company on its path of going public. In 2006, Lawrence Levy was one of the main contributors to the acquisition of Pixar by Disney at the price of US$7.6 billion. Jobs believed that many key strategic decisions were the outcome of terms negotiated by Lawrence Levy and himself. Next, we will extract the core content of this book in three parts. Part 1, Pixar's Early Struggles why was it difficult for an animation company with remarkable creativity to maintain its existence? Part 2, How did Pixar overcome difficulties in order to successfully go public? Part 3, Did Pixar have nothing to worry about after going public? We have previously talked about the origins of Pixar. In its early days, Pixar owned a talented team, but earned little business revenue. In 1994, Steve Jobs invited Lawrence Levy to join Pixar. After a period of time, Lawrence Levy found that Pixar faced three major challenges in its business. We will list these challenges below. Pixar's first challenge was that its business was not of great commercial value. Pixar had three main businesses, namely animated advertising, animated short films, and software sales. Let's first talk about animated advertising. The production cost of animated advertising was very high. A 30-second animated advertisement might cost US$125,000 and took a team of three or four persons three months to produce. Therefore, the quoted price of Pixar's animated advertising was often high, which affected its sales volume. Even if some advertisers planned to cooperate with Pixar, this sum of money would only cover production expenses or serve as a small margin of profit. Secondly, they made animated short films. Pixar's animated short films were very popular with audiences, but they generally only appeared at commercial exhibitions, film festivals, or occasionally in the opening credits. In other words, these films had a very limited market. What's more, the animated short films were unprofitable due to their high cost. 
Finally, they dealt with software sales. Render Man was a piece of software developed by Pixar for drawing computer graphics. With advanced technology, the software was sold at a high price, so it was only appropriate for high-cost films and certain commercial advertisements. Common users could neither afford it nor needed it. It was only used by approximately 50 large studios for their work. In order to find a new foothold in this industry, Lawrence Levy decided to stop selling software and dissolve the commercial advertising department. The foothold of the industry was an animated feature film, which Pixar had been working on at that time, later named Toy Story. Pixar's second challenge was the long production cycle of animated feature films and their unpredictable market returns. Before its release, it's difficult to predict a film's popularity or market returns. For example, the production cycle of Toy Story was four years, and no one could foresee what the profits or reputation of this film would be before its release. Moreover, animated films were different from live-action films. A number of live-action films could be shot in a year to avoid risk through diversification. Even Disney usually only produced two animated feature films in a year. Pixar was unable to bear such risks, as such, it signed an agreement with Disney. But this agreement also became the third challenge to Pixar. Within the duration of the agreement from 1991 to 2004, Pixar could only make films, television, or video programs for Disney, but could not confer, discuss, or collaborate with other customers. In addition, Pixar could earn a proportion of box office returns, but the final percentage of box office returns was less than 10%, once the costs and expenses payable to Disney were calculated and deducted. The agreement also required that Pixar could only choose to shoot film sequels under limited conditions. For example, Original films could be produced within the range of budget accepted by both parties, and agreements should be reached based on Disney's standards. Unless Pixar met all the specified conditions, Disney could use Pixar's animation characters at will. The implications of this agreement will be discussed at length in Part 3. We have now examined the first part about Pixar's early struggles why it was difficult for an animation company with remarkable creativity to maintain its existence. It was due to three major problems. Pixar's business was not of great commercial value, so Pixar decided to focus on animated feature films. But the animated feature films had a long production cycle, and brought unpredictable market returns. Pixar couldn't bear the risks. So they decided to sign an agreement with Disney, but were constrained as a result of the agreement. Lawrence Levy and Steve Jobs mapped out a simple work plan for Pixar, after deciding to focus on animated feature films. The most crucial step was to raise a large sum of money to pay for the film production cost and branding, in order to be able to gain a bigger share of the profits. The only way for a small company like Pixar to get an enormous sum of money, was to go public. From here on, we will talk about the second part, how did Pixar overcome difficulties in order to successfully go public? In addition to making unprecedentedly successful films for large audiences, Pixar went through the following four challenges in order to go public. The first challenge was to expand the board of directors. The investors would be happy to see a professional and informed board of directors, instead of Jobs wielding authority by himself. Jobs had previously been in charge of a department in Apple Incorporated, and other employees could hardly work with him due to his arbitrariness and bad temper. Jobs was deeply affected by his leaving of the company he himself had founded. As a result, he intended to hold absolute control over the management of Pixar. However, this made it impossible for Pixar to go public. Jobs considered this problem and put forward the following solution. The board of directors could be expanded, but on a small scale. It should consist of people who could bring Pixar credibility in Hollywood, and who had the best interests of Pixar at heart, preferably people he already knew. The first candidate was Skip Brittenham, an elite lawyer in Hollywood, who knew Hollywood's business very well. What's more, Pixar was also a client of the law firm where Skip worked. The second candidate was Joe Graziano who was the CFO of Apple during Jobs' tenure. 
Joe was in an adventurous stage of his career at that time with a strong interest in Pixar. The last candidate was Larry Sincini, Lawrence Levy's advisor, and Job's good friend and consultant. Only after Larry agreed to join, did Pixar officially begin its path to go public. The second challenge for going public was to search for investment banks. Only by obtaining the approval from investment banks, could Pixar start discussing their investment issues with investors. During that period, two investment banks were considerable in Jobs' mind, namely Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Jobs successively sent invitations to the executives of the Silicon Valley branch offices of both banks. He introduced Pixar's development history and short films to the two executives, who showed great interest and greatly admired the artistic creations of Pixar. However, they eventually refused to invest in Pixar after considering the related risks. Jobs' dream to go public seemed to end in a flash. However, there was still hope. Al how Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley rejected Pixar, this didn't represent the position of all investment banks. Lawrence Levy thought of Robertson Stevens, an investment bank that he had cooperated with before. This bank specialized in the listing of high-tech enterprises. It operated on a small scale, but enjoyed a very high reputation in Silicon Valley. Nevertheless, there was one fatal disadvantage. It had no experience in the entertainment industry. Lawrence Levy had no choice but to invite two experts of Robertson Stevens, who had spoken highly of Pixar's animation, to visit Pixar. After several days of consideration, the bank then decided to join Pixar's initial public offerings, also known as an IPO. The CEO of the bank even ambitiously promised to attend Pixar's every roadshow, meet investors from various regions, and share Pixar's stories. Later, Lawrence Levy also invited another investment bank with unquestionable qualifications in the entertainment industry to join. A second hidden issue was thus eliminated. The third challenge was for the IPO team to draft Pixar's prospectus. Public offerings should be performed according to this prospectus, that disclosed all aspects of Pixar's business in detail. The risk that every investor should know about would be discussed through qualitative and quantitative analysis. The prospectus included Pixar's development history, vision, business plan, technology, animation and production process, competitors, risk, top management, board officers, stock equity, stock option incentive plans, and numerous other details. In the prospectus, suggestions were also made on the price of stocks issued by Pixar, which would be the ideal price that investment bank experts thought the investors would pay for. Determining how to issue stock prices is as much an art as a science. For example, 60 million US dollars would be raised if Pixar sold 6 million stocks at the stock price of 10 US dollars. Or 120 million US dollars would be raised if the stock price was 20 US dollars. Pixar's stock returns depended on the stock price issued. The prospectus only gave a suggested price, while the actual price would be determined on the first day of the stock exchange. Before that, they needed to visit the investors, whose interest in Pixar would indicate whether the actual sales price of Pixar's stock on the first day, was equal to, higher, or lower than the suggested price. Pixar's prospectus was almost as thick as a book. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, also known as the SEC, privately told Lawrence Levy that it was the most detailed prospectus they had ever seen. After submitting this prospectus, they had to later answer the questions raised by the SEC. The IPO would fail if any of the investment bank experts, lawyers, accountants, or the SEC were not satisfied with this prospectus. These legal documents would eventually be put on records in the SEC, and be delivered to every potential investor. Lastly, they needed to conduct a nationwide IPO roadshow, in order to visit the potential investors separately and tell them Pixar's stories. The investment banks would adjust the opening price according to the investor's interest. A lower IPO opening price led to less capital raised from stocks by Pixar, but the investor's demand would rise. Conversely, a higher opening price led to more capital raised, but there was a risk of decline demand by the investors, which might result in a decrease in the stock's price. 
In the road show, it's necessary to make a slide about Pixar's experiences. Steve Jobs made the presentation himself. He paid attention to every detail, and even strictly controlled the imperceptible word space and smoothness of the content, so as to make sure that every road show was spotless. The aforementioned CEO of Robertson Stevens joined them, and spared no effort to promote the show. This road show was well received, and attracted a great number of investors. The premiere of Toy Story was held at the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood on a Sunday in November 1995. Pixar's IPO destiny would be indicated by the audience's response. The premiere was a great success. Ten days later, Pixar's 6 million stocks were put on the market at the price of 22 US dollars per share. It quickly rose to more than 30 US dollars after opening, showing great market demand. At the end of the first trading day, the closing price was 39 US dollars. As a result, Pixar's market capitalization reached 1.46 billion US dollars, quickly making Jobs into a billionaire. In this second part, we've explained how Pixar overcame difficulties in order to successfully go public. Pixar overcame four challenges step by step in the process of going public. First, they expanded the board of directors. Second, they searched for investment banks. Third, the listing team drafted a prospectus. Fourth, they carried out a nationwide IPO roadshow. After the above four challenges were overcome and of Toy Story premiered successfully, Pixar finally went public. Pixar's market capitalization reached 1.46 billion US dollars by the end of its first trading day. Today we are just sharing limited bookie. To unlock more key insights of world-class bestseller, please download our app. Just search for B-O-O-K-E-Y at Apple Store or Google Play. You will get 7 days free trail with more features.